Let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike. This is preeminently the time to speak the truth, the whole truth, frankly and boldly. History doesn't have to be boring, buttoned up, or inaccessible. And it certainly didn't end in 1945. It belongs to all of us, and we share and add to it every day. Welcome to the History of Go-Go podcast, where I interview interesting guests, cover a motley crew of topics, and it's a place where you can sit, think, and drink all at the same time. I'm your host, Rob Mellon. Man, you're bringing it all back to me. That, is, that sounded good. I love working with these talented artists. I always wanted to be an artist when I was a kid. I used to draw. And suddenly I saw people who could draw a thousand times better than I ever could. And I was giving them the stories. They were drawing them. And it, it was a collaboration that was so exciting to discuss a story and a few days later to see it all drawn on boards, then a month later to see it in a book and to know that kids are reading these and enjoying them. My guest today is Professor of Jewish Literature and American Studies, Dr. Jeremy Dauber. He received a degree from Harvard and his doctorate from the University of Oxford, which he attended as a Rhodes Scholar. He is a distinguished writer who used to write a column for the Christian Science Monitor on TV and movies. That column was recognized by the National Society of Newspaper Columnists. He has also written several books, including Jewish Comedy, A Serious History, The Worlds of Shalom Aleichem, The Remarkable Life and Afterlife of the Man Who Created Tevi, and In the Demon's Bedroom, Yiddish Literature and the Early Modern. His most recent work is American Comics, A History, which is the sweeping story of cartoons, comic strips, and graphic novels, and their hold on the American imagination. Of the book, Marissa Moss of the New York Journal of Books says, no detail escapes Dauber. A master storyteller, Dauber shows just how much there is to appreciate in this uniquely American history. And we are very pleased to have the distinguished professor and decorated writer with us today. Welcome, Professor Dauber. Thank you so much. It's, uh, it's great to be here. You know, I was going to call you Dr. Dauber, but based on our topic, I thought it made you sound like a supervillain. So, <laughs> I thought Professor was a better option. <laughs> We're Jeremy. Jeremy is perfect. So it's okay. either, way, either way. But the, I don't want to be sound like a supervillain. So <laughs> well, I really love your cover. I mean, it's visually arresting. It looks like comics that are in a comic book store, really, just stacked up like that. So I just wanted to commend you on that. The book's great, but the cover is awesome, too. Thank you. You know, it's the one thing where, you know, you have these meetings. And they always come in, they say, they say, well, we all, we love the cover. We hope you'll love it too. And usually you're like, well, let's see. But you see this and you're like, wow, this is fantastic. And I can praise this to the skies because I did not draw this thing. I did not design it. So, <laughs> um, um, you know, so I hope that if you're looking at a bookstore, you, you'll spot it right away from across the crowded room. Professor Dauber, it is tradition here to accompany the conversation with a special brew. Today, we have Buzzman Mutant American Ale from the Unsung Brewing Company, located in Orange County, California. The brewers at Unsung were raised on Batman, come of age with the Incredible Hulk, and wore out their Spidey Super Stories LP. Because of that, they decided to start a superhero-themed brewery, and each of their beers has a comic book-style backstory, and that includes Buzzman. Remember, the best way to enjoy an episode is with one of our featured brews. This is also my time to ask you to subscribe to the podcast. Subscribing is the only way to get the newest material right away. To the expanding legion of listeners and supporters from more than 80 countries in over 2,000 cities across the globe, I have to say thank you. And now, I raise my Buzzman Mutant American Ale very high. And to those that create stories that take us to different worlds, tell of amazing powers, and provide us with an action-packed alternate universe, I say cheers. Using images to tell a story, that goes back to the earliest civilizations. But I want to fast forward to the 19th century and Thomas Nast. You know, he stands up to Tammany Hall and he has those depictions of Boss Tweed, almost look like a modern day supervillain. I mean, you could see the creators of Kingpin, for example, being influenced by Nast. Do you see Nast's work 
affecting the comics of today or his work influencing the comics of today? Yeah, it's a great question. And I, th- I think so, you know, maybe not knowingly or consciously where people say, oh, well, I'm channeling Thomas Nast. But in some ways, as you know, Robin, and maybe readers of the book will find out, you know, Nast is responsible for so many of these iconic images in American society, that Uncle Sam image that we have. The image of Santa Claus, the Republican donkey, the uh, excuse me, the Republican elephant, the uh, Democratic <laughs> donkey. So when people are channeling those, they really are sort of uh, paying homage and sort of channeling Thomas Nast, even if they don't know that they are. So that really was a part where I wanted to start the story there because it's it's really where things take off. Well, it says a lot based on those images that you just described, Santa Claus and Uncle Sam. I mean, his art really stands the test of time. Yeah, I, th- I think that's I think that's right. You know, one of the things that you look, you know, at these images and you say these political cartoons, in some ways, they could appear now, and they really, you know, I when when we were talking before about Kingpin and things like that, you know, we're talking about some of these superhero comics or whatever. But if you talk about the tradition of political cartooning, certainly people are explicitly and knowingly channeling Thomas Nast, and and it really just stands cheek by jowl with, uh, you know, the the greats of all time uh, in that capacity, too. In The Yellow Kid and McFadden Flats, that was published in 1897, is that the first time the word comic book is actually used? And because of that, does that make it the first comic? Well, you know, I think what you're saying, Rob, which which is right, is that somehow we feel a little bit different about this Yellow Kid, as he was generally called, than we do about a lot of things that come before it. Like you as a historian, I'm always very, very leery of pointing to something and saying, this is the absolute beginning and there's nothing I'm doing with you because there's always sort of things. But, uh, you know, for comic strips, comic books come a little later, right? But comic strips, we really do feel like something is different happening around the other kid. It really puts a lot of things together, first of all. It puts together a continuing character. It puts together speech balloons and text and image sort of uh, together. And it also really is the, the I don't, again, I don't want to say the first, but in many ways, the first instantiation of a nationally known and merchandised and merchandisable character. You know, if we're talking about a story of American comics, like the one I tell in my book, if you're talking about an American comic character in that thorough, full way, Yellow Kid is not a bad place to start. So for both formal reasons and, in some sense, historical and cultural reasons, the Yellow Kid, very, very important in that development. And as you say, late 19th century, that's really where we're starting. Very late 19th century, right around that turn of that century. Now, that's interesting because I had a podcast on the glam rock of the 1980s. And of course, a lot of those bands were very similar. But when Guns N' Roses comes around, it wasn't like that type of hard rock or glam rock hadn't been done. It had been done before Guns N' Roses, but something was different. And so that just uh, marks a change in the music at the time. I'm sure that happens in comics as well. I think that's absolutely right, is that, you know, you, you can point as a cultural historian or telling a historical story to lots of different sort of moments on the way. But somehow, you know, and we can talk about different points in, in the history, there's someone who says, I've managed to put all this together in a way that feels fresh and new and different, no matter what, uh, you know, uh, has actually historically come before it. So the same way if we move to 1938 and Superman, which originally started by Siegel and Schuster as they wanted it to be a comic strip, and there have been comic strips for decades before, and you can point to all of these various influences in Pulp Fiction and in comic strips and all these things. But nonetheless, Superman is something different, and it's different because everyone says, wow, this is something different. And I think that's similar to the, uh, you know, the Guns N' Roses example that you're giving, where I remember, I mean, I was precisely the age where you sort of felt, wow, that's something new. Well, and you brought up Superman, so maybe we can talk about what they refer to as the golden age of comics, generally considered in the 30s and the 1940s. What's going on in society at the time, economically and politically, that makes that specific time period just prime for the popularity of comic books? I think it's a great question. I mean, I think that, you know, one of the things that's happening is that comic books are really becoming a kind of new format, right? As we've been saying, People are really used to reading comics as strips in the newspapers. That's a very big business at this point. It's very nationally spread. But this new thing of a pamphlet that you can find on the newsstands, it's a book, a little pamphlet of comics. That's pretty new and and is a standalone item. 
newspapers, obviously, kids love the comics in them, but by and large, they were an adult proposition. You know, you don't see lots of kids going to school every day reading the newspaper, but, but you see people, adults going to work doing it. The comics really could be for kids. And some of the messages that were in these comics in this first golden age, particularly of superheroes, costumed heroes, as they might better have called it at the time, really were resonating with kids sort of at the both at the tail end of the Great Depression, living out a kind of Rooseveltian kind of fight for the little guy. That's really how Superman starts against sort of some of these big business interests. But also they resonated with kids just by virtue of kiddom. Superman is a kind of wish fulfillment fantasy. And some of the other characters, Captain Marvel or Shazam, however you want to call them through the years, right? Really, there's a there's a kid. He says a magic word and he becomes super big and grown up and super strong and he can fight bad guys. I have little kids of my own. Let me tell you, that's a that's a dream come true uh, for somebody that age. And it, it really took off. And then only a, a couple of years later, you know, we're entering World War II. You know, I am also in my job, I'm a professor of American studies. I'm also a professor of Jewish literature. And so I get asked, you know, there are a lot, a lot of Jewish people who were involved in that first golden age of comics. What did that say about the comics? What does it do? And I think a lot of the stuff is overstated, but I don't think there's a question that many comic books were more pro-intervention. They were more, they were pro-getting into the war a couple of years before a lot of the country was. A lot of the country was pretty isolationist before Pearl Harbor. Uh, and then, of course, everyone changed. But, but I think that having a group of people who had family in Europe, who really were having a sort of a closer look at what Hitler was doing, you know, that made comics like Captain America, which premiered before Pearl Harbor, you know, it made many of those, not all, but many of those comics much more anti-isolationist than, than other th kinds of things. So that starts. And then once that starts, once Pearl Harbor comes, you know, the comic books become very, very important in sort of pro-patriotic messaging, selling war bonds, uh, encouraging recycling, support for the armed forces, uh, all that kind of stuff. So you really do have a lot of that stuff going on now. You mentioned Captain America in that first issue where he's punching Hitler. And if you look at it today, you could say, of course, it makes perfect sense now. We know Hitler is a vile character and one of those true monsters in history. But at the time, it wasn't so clear cut. In fact, it was before the United States entered the war. And it was somewhat controversial that he was punching Hitler, making that type of message. It's controversial that Captain America did that before the United States entered the war. That's exactly right. Uh, I mean, Joe Simon and Jack Kirby, who were the two creators of Captain America, they actually got threats from the, you know, some of the German-American population, from other people, right? The mayor of New York at the time, Fiorello LaGuardia, had to station some policemen, apparently, at their offices because they were worried about getting threats uh, because of this. So, as you say, as uncontroversial now as it seems to, for a superhero to give Hitler a sock on the jaw, <laughs> not quite the case back then in the in the very very early 1940s that would change very quickly as we're saying after pearl harbor but not not then if you're in that golden age in the 30s and 40s did you almost have to be in new york city maybe because that's where the publishers were at or that's where the talent had coalesced i think that's you know you're, you're framing it exactly right rob i mean so much of this and so much of any story of, of, of a mass media and any cultural history is really about those structural and institutional factors and you can't, you know, uh, accentuate enough that comic books, and now we've moved really on to comic books, really was a low status kind of second grade publishing medium at this beginning time. Uh, very quickly, quite profitable, but still very low status. It was based in New York, and it was sort of basically the people who people knew. Nobody was like, let's find the best person in the entire world to draw the adventures of, you know, Green Lantern, right? They were like, oh, we know somebody. He's a cousin. You know, let's let's bring him in. And the the pace of this stuff, remember being on a monthly schedule and everything, and, and, and the amount of content really meant that you you were creating the equivalent of these comic sweatshops, these shop systems, to kind of push out this stuff. You couldn't be, let's just take a random, like in Chicago and wait for your stuff to take a couple of days to go back and forth. It just wasn't viable. So that factor, as well as those network factors of who do we know who we can get into the business, very important in keeping that business for quite some time, a couple of decades even after this really quite local. And that would change as the technology changed. Federal Express changed that. 
quite a bit where you could sort of send art over and you could be sure it would come the next day. And of course, the internet has changed it you know, entirely, it sort of changed everything. If we go back to the propaganda piece for just a second, sure. you brought up that in the industry, the comic books or the graphic novels, those were somewhat lowbrow at the time. And you probably had a lot of young guys working in the industry. Does the government, though, <laughs> realize that because of those factors, it's a great propaganda tool or recruitment tool. They can get into those much easier than they could get into, say, the New York Times. Well, I, I think that's right. And, you know, it's funny that you mentioned the New York Times. I'm smiling, uh, as, our, as our listeners can't see, because the New York Times, of course, famously is one of the few newspapers that didn't have comic strips. But you do have comic strips where in all the newspapers also being involved in this thing. You have, you have comic strips that really haven't sort of lasted the test of time but that were literally kind of approved by the Secretary of the Navy, I think it was called Don Winslow of the Navy, if I remember correctly, to, uh, to, to try and encourage recruitment. Certainly, uh, you know, people are, are, are very well aware uh, that comic books are also kind of putting out these messages or selling war bonds and this kind of, this kind of thing as well. You know, so you absolutely have that kind of pro-government, pro-intervention you know, pro intervention, uh, message that's there. That's absolutely the case. And it continues, of course, all the way through the war. I don't think that really, you know, we can later on, if we want to over this, talk about how comics, you know, is a medium that can express a wide variety of political messages, right? It's not, you know, there's no particular ideology that's necessary. But at this point, if you were to look at a snapshot of comics sort of in the 1940s, early 1940s, you're not finding a lot of anti-war material uh, that's going on here. Uh, I think also one of the, one of the most interesting questions, though, was a decision, particularly by um, the superhero company, particularly by National, which we're going to see, to say, let's not have the superheroes go to Europe. Let's, right? I mean, you could think, oh, Superman could win the war in, you know, five seconds, right? Just, and they, they, that was a very conscious, so in this sense, which is what you're talking about, a very conscious decision to kind of put the superheroes in the background, keep them on the home front, and allow for uh, America's fighting forces uh, to really be the heroes there, to be the greatest generation. What that also led to, which is interesting that we can talk about, right, is some of these questions of saying, you know, there were saboteurs on the home front a little bit, right? There were these questions and there, were, there was a lot of trampling of due process and constitutional rights in the name of making sure that the home front was secure. And some of that is also this kind of undercurrent that you see, because of course, superheroes, uh, Superman, he is all about fairness. But I don't think due process is exactly what you would call uh, <laughs> something that superheroes are really all about, right? And so that becomes not necessarily in the heroes that we know the best, let's say, but certainly in some of these lesser known characters, you have people saying, we've got to make sure that we ramp out every, any fifth columnist and anybody, anybody who thinks differently from us, we've got to make, and that gets to a little bit sort of uncomfortable territory. So part of the story I'm telling in the book is also every so often, uh, and sometimes very commonly, you know, you have this stuff that you look back and you say, you know, that's really not so great, even if the main thrust of a lot of the stuff is, you know, kind of stuff that you're very happy happened. So you don't think when Spider-Man webs up these alleged criminals, that's a good use of due process at that time? <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, it's, you know, it becomes an interesting, and it's a question that, of course, the comics industry Right, begins to take up as the comics get more towards older kids and adults. Right, when you're seven, you don't really care. There's a bad guy, right? You know, and then, right, sure, yeah. But when you're 15, you know, if you're and you're 20, right, you can imagine a story and Marvel really, so you know, worth saying, well, you know, fine, you web him up, right? But then he doesn't go to jail because his lawyer argues <laughs> that he, uh, you know, his rights were violated in the process of this or something like that. And those kind of stories are both kind of ingenious and funny in some ways, right? But also getting to this question that even from the very beginning was at the heart of a lot of the superhero thing, which was, what role does this have in an American system, right? How American are these heroes if what they're really doing is not obeying the law? And that sort of, you know, the, that expanded and expanded until you get these things like the Civil War things in Marvel, where you say, well, either they're going to be registered by the government or they're going to be vigilantes. And, you know, comics have been in recent decades, I think, quite good at playing out a lot of the ramifications of those kind of vigilanteist questions, which ultimately, you know, many of these superheroes, even if they are on the side of right, you know, are. 
So the comic book industry really struggled to find its footing following World War II. What were some of the reasons for that decline in interest? Well, that's a great question. And and again, you know, I think there's some over-given answers and some under-given answers. And I'll start with the surprise. The under-given answer in the 1950s for why the comic book industry takes a bit of a dive is television, right? It, it, it just 1950s is a decade when, where television goes from not being in anybody's household to being in everybody's household by the end of the decade. And kids, not surprisingly, are saying, you know, this is great. There's, uh, there's stuff I can watch on TV. I'm not going to spend as much time or as much money on these comics. So that's, that's the reason that nobody talks about, but I think probably swamps all the other reasons combined. That said, of course, certain genres of comics really get hit very hard, particularly what we're often called the crime comics and horror comics, by external forces, external to the market, so to speak, and particularly by a series of moral, a moral panic and a kind of senatorial inquiry into juvenile delinquency and the argument that these comics are causing juvenile delinquency or, or contributors uh, to juvenile delinquency. Well, you bring that up, and there there are a great many fears in the 1950s. And after Frederick Wortham's Seduction of the Innocent, comic books are added to that list of fears. Now, let's see if I can get some of his criticisms correct. <laughs> he says Superman was a fascist, <laughs> Batman and Robin were possibly homosexual, and Wonder Woman was a lesbian with some sort of a bondage fetish. Is that all kind of correct? Because that seems... <laughs> That seems 1950s, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I think that's right. I mean, I think Wortham is off base about a lot of this stuff. I mean, I, th- I think as we've already talked about on the podcast, there are these these underlying currents that that Wortham, who was who was not simply a kind of caricature of a character, he was a very smart and very successful social psychologist, who then really didn't quite get comic books right. But his actual thoughts were a little bit more nuanced than we generally sort of think they are. That said, he got a lot of stuff kind of off base. We've already talked a little bit about this concern about sort of the kinds of ways about violence kind of at the root of comics, right? Uh, at the root of these superhero comics. It kind of then elevates that among other people, you and the only one, but into this kind of fascist kind of argument, which, of course, as you can imagine, you know, infuriated all of these Jewish creators of the comics to have their work kind of associated with this movement that was associated with Nazism was just anathema and disgusting. And, and, this idea of the sidekicks being kind of this sign of homosexuality, this seems totally bizarre and really kind of off base. He was probably right about all the bondage stuff in Wonder Woman. I think that's probably, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, there's other stuff also that he was right about. It, it, it should be said. Many, uh, one very popular genre of comics at the time uh, was called jungle comics. And, uh, you know, they, were, they took place in jungles. Uh, and very frequently, the way in which they treated well, Africans, not African-Americans, because many of them were in Africa, was just straightforward racist. Mm. And Wortham had done a lot of work with African-American communities in Harlem. He had done a lot of this. And he really called out those comics for being racist. And, you know, he was right about that, to be perfectly honest. And a lot of the emphasis that we put as scholars on this code of conduct for comic books, you know, is a lot about sort of cutting out some of this sort of more mature stuff. What it also cut out was a lot of the racism. Mm. But it did that, unfortunately, right? There's no law like the law of unintended consequences. It did that. And people said, well, you know what? We're not going to make sure we don't have any racist caricatures of the kind that weren't, but we're going to do that by eliminating kind of black characters sort of basically entirely from the comic books. Mm. So, I mean, I'm glad there weren't as many racist caricatures as there had been sort of in in, in the pre-code comics, but it wasn't such a great solution. And it took a couple of decades for that to play itself out. So it's a more kind of nuanced process. I mean, you know, this is a nuanced podcast, so I feel like I can go into these kind of details. Absolutely. But overall, you know, a lot of what Wortham did was even sometimes if some of the underlying causes were, the methods were terrible. He really misrepresented some a lot of his data. He seems to have made up interviews. He really did a lot of stuff that was not kosher for the sake of kind of putting out this message and for getting some public limelight, which was something that really mattered to him. But overall... I think what did in a lot of these comics, maybe specific comics really were because of Wortham and, and some of this uh, moral panic. But a lot of the, the decline of comics in the 50s was also about television. And then the last thing I'll say was that Bill Gaines, who was the head of the company that really was the ground zero for a lot of these attacks, this EC Comics, basically said, screw it, I'm going to get out of the comics business. He took a lot of his talent, 
he went on to turn one of the comics, the humor comic Mad Magazine, into a magazine. And then, you know, started off the careers of more delinquents and countercultural <laughs> figures, you know, than, than ever would have come otherwise, I think. So, as I said, the law of unintended consequences, I think, uh, is what matters the most in some ways. You have the Comics Code of Authority and that self-regulation, and that comes out of the 1950s also. Could you explain some of the rules and restrictions that were imposed on the writers and the artists by that code? Yeah. So the way that it worked, and you're, you're, you're absolutely right in saying this was a self-regulation thing, and I think that's very important. You know, Wortham and, and, and so the Senate and everyone really understood that they couldn't you know, say you can't publish this stuff, right? That would run into constitutional issues. What they had to do was kind of put the squeeze on to make sure that there would be a lot of communities that would say, we're going to boycott grocery stores and newsstands and people would sell this stuff. And then, of course, it would become financially unviable for the companies to put any of this stuff out. So instead, they would agree to this kind of regulation that would then be able to put a seal of approval on these comics, this comics code of the seal of the comics code authority saying, okay, this is all right. You know, you can, you can, send this to your kids and what have you. And that was basically how it worked, was that all of the stories, all of the work would have to be pre-submitted to this authority for a prior approval. And at the beginning, of course, there was a lot of manipulation and censorship. Eventually, all of those rules, which we'll get to in a second, but were, um, you know, internalized, basically. So people just didn't bother to write stuff that they knew wouldn't, you know, get past the code, basically. Right. And a lot of it is, you know, some of the stuff that we've been saying, right, uh, and some of the stuff that you can imagine, you know, no gore, no violence, no sex, really kind of very white picket fence, what we've come to associate with the 50s, sort of heterosexual, father knows best kind of marriage, right? You know, no um, challenging of authority figures. So that was very right. If you saw a policeman in a code approved comic book, certainly as of the 1950s, that policeman was always going to be perfectly good and never, you know, you could always trust this policeman. You could always trust political figures to do exactly the right thing, that kind of thing. So as you can imagine, this was a kind of product that if you involve these kind of characters, quickly felt a little stale for people who got a little older and said, you know, I'm interested in a kind of more nuance to, to the world. And so, uh, you know, that was a reason why those comics became increasingly felt as kind of more juvenile propositions. Now that would change as this as 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 time would go on, but but certainly that first period, that's that, those are a lot of the rules. Doesn't it create a situation where it's almost comedic, or it doesn't even have an element of darkness to it at all? The villains are two dimensional. The good guy always wins, and the reality is that's not very interesting. I think o- often that was the case. To be honest, I think you know in some ways. Any restriction, you know, is like the restrictions on poems to make a sonnet, right? You work within this to create certain kinds of creativity. So, for example, in some of the Superman comics of that period, which were all kind of code approved, right? You know, you have this image where Superman travels back in time to Krypton. Uh, There's one very famous sort of uh, story. And he kind of, he can't tell all of the people, like including his parents who he meets, you know, who he becomes friends with because he's a grown up, right? That Krypton is going to explode. So it's actually this quite moving, you know, story, but it's all done in a way that has to be done, you know, in this sort of quasi melodramatic manner, but also reaches this kind of pathos. So I'm not saying that most of the stories got to this kind of aesthetic height. They didn't. But you could work within this to get this thing. But in practice, as you say, most of them didn't, which was really fine in certain ways for a, a seven, eight, nine, ten year old reading audience. That was OK. You didn't need to have these things. But if you were 15, you know, you were going to say, okay, well, you know, I'm kind of done with this. I'll go read Mad Magazine instead, right? That's, that's telling me what I want to know about not all authority figures are all okay. You know? What happens in the industry then when the old guard, those masters, those writers and creators from the 30s and 40s, when they retire or they just leave the industry and you have this influx of new writers and creators and artists in, I guess it would be the 70s? By that point, as you say, there's a real changing of the guard. Um, you have a lot of very young people coming in. What's also interesting is that, uh, uh, that these young people 
unlike the old guard, have grown up on comic books, right? So they, in, in some ways, they, they, it's not that they didn't read other things, many of them did, right? But they, they really have a world in which these characters have stories, they have, they have this, and they have a, an attachment to them that, you know, maybe, you know, an, an old figure who created, uh, you know, some of these characters has an attachment to them, but it's not the same. They're the creations, right? Here, these are these things that exist. And so they're very interested in both... I would say politicizing them and, and sort of using them as vehicles to accept, to address what's going on now. And that always meant the kind of push uh, against the code uh, in certain kinds of ways. Here we're talking about superhero comics, right? Mainstream comics, right? And also in some sense, a kind, so that's, that's a, a kind of radicalism, but also a kind of conservatism of saying, you know, there was a golden age. Things were better back then. And we want to go back to the way things are. So for example, the same radical Denny O'Neill, Dennis O'Neill, right, who says, I'm going to try and make these things very political and have kind of a radical Green Arrow character and these Green Arrow and Green Lanterns, is also the one who says, I want Batman to be like he was in the 30s. I want him to be kind of a gothic, scary guy. I don't want him to be this fun-loving Batman in the 50s. <laughs> and so it's interesting, right, because as I don't need to, we all know, people are complicated, right? So they can be both conservative and radical kind of at the same time uh, in different ways. And I think both of those currents happen simultaneously in many ways with this with this kind of new guard but they're in both ways they're kind of pushing right if you want this kind of uh more uh conservative batman back to the original right you also want a psychotic joker mm. and that psychotic joker really is not a great fit with kind of the code uh, uh of, of this so starting in the 70s there also there's a reframing of the code it, it, it allows for a little bit more and there's a little bit more boundary pushing that begins to go on. And that continues even more as, again, business situations begin to change over the next decade, 15 years, in which there are now these comic book stores that don't necessarily have to worry about, you know, is someone going to boycott the newsstand? Is someone going to boycott the grocery store, right? They have people who are coming in who are saying, I have disposable income. I'm a little older. I want more mature stories and I'm willing to pay for them. And that begins to herald a brand new revolution of what comics look like, too. I think of a storyline where Spider-Man or Peter Parker actually loses his girlfriend, Gwen Stacy. She's murdered by the Green Goblin. And it just seems to me that coming out or at the conclusion of or towards the end of the Vietnam War, the United States is generally not hitting on all cylinders economically at that time. It almost seems like that is the storyline that needed to be told in the mid-70s. I think that's absolutely right. I think, you know, you're, you're, you've zeroed in on one of the, I think, most important storylines of sort of the end of that kind of Silver Age, the beginning of that Bronze Age, you know, where we're saying that there can be a kind of grief and seriousness uh, sort of in these stories. And, and I think one of the most important aspects of that was a widespread belief at the time among readers of comics and among writers of comics for that matter, that Gwen Stacy, when she died, would stay dead. That this was this was it, right? And so there were real sort of emotional stakes to what was going on there, um, which also meant that there was, and, and and this seems so obvious now, but that there would be a before and an after, which Marvel kind of always did. But but we, you know, Peter would have to process Peter Parker, Spider Man would have to process this trauma. You would have to kind of move with it. It would come. It could come back to haunt him, right? As opposed to kind of the eternal now of these kids' comics of the fifties, right? But as you say, the sort of post-Vietnam period is beginning to make itself felt. Captain America is beginning to become a little bit disillusioned uh, with America. You could not have done that 10 years before. You wouldn't have done this 10 years before. And that really is beginning to kind of make a change. The, co the code is allowing, at this point, for authority figures to be presented in more complicated lights. They don't all have to be good all the time. And, and so that allows, uh, you know, that matches, as you're saying, very nicely with this kind of post-Vietnam, post-Nixon uh, uh, kind of sense of where is the country going? Have we kind of lost our way? For a lot of companies over the years, but two seem, you know, to make their way through all of the rough waters. And there were several periods where the comic books and so forth struggled. But DC and Marvel seem to make its way through. Is it because of the quality of their characters? Is it because of their creators? Is it their business sense? Why are those two companies able to navigate those rough waters? You know, I, I think it's a great question. And some of it has to do 
I think there are two reasons. I mean, I think some of it has to do just with, um, uh, you know, as you say, these sort of archetypal characters and sort of the, the faithfulness of, a, of an audience that's going to continue through, but paired with the way in which they've been able to leverage those characters in all sorts of other institutions that can keep them afloat when uh, the, the, the flagship, you could argue, uh, of the business, which is the production of comics themselves, is not always as lucrative as it has been at other times. So, you know, there are times when you could say that merchandising really kept Marvel afloat. Certainly now, uh, it is fair to say that Marvel is, is getting much more money from the movie business than they are from the comic book business. And you can certainly say, well, you know, uh, th that Marvel Studios would be nothing without the comic books. But in some ways, it's not too crazy to think in a cynical kind of way that Marvel Comics are being kept around for just as much for intellectual product to, you know, inspire different movies, very cheap storyboarding um, than, than the other way around. And, 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 you know, in many ways, that situation has occurred in one way or another also at other times through comics history. But certainly um, that is the case, I think, now is that if you talk to a lot of people, they know Captain America and Iron Man and these, not through the comic books. They, they come to them through the movies. And maybe they'll pick up a comic book or maybe not. You know. When do minority superheroes start to come onto the scene? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, I, I think that by and large, and, again, you know, you know, but by and large, we're talking about uh, with certain very notable exceptions like Black Panther. You know, we're really talking about sort of that same period of radicalism that we were talking about late 60s, early 70s. And particularly, you know, characters like the Falcon, Power Man, Luke Cage, Power Man, uh, a couple of these others, you know, people saying, well, we, we need to uh, incorporate this a little bit more into uh, sort of the Marvel Universe. There are some equivalent ones in the DC Universe. But still, you know, very, very uh, tentative and often very tokenistic in a certain way. You know, this was sort of representing uh, a certain kind of uh, black experience in some ways. Uh, Luke Cage was very clearly, you know, an, they saw sort of the success of these black exploitation movies that were right around the time they said, OK, you know, we're going we're gonna to put this in. I think that a lot of the story begins to develop, you know, more and more sort of as time, as time goes on, but is concomitant. Uh, with a slow, but now increasing, thankfully, wider diversity uh, of, of, of talent behind the scenes. Uh, also sort of speaking to this, sort of saying, you know, these, these stories uh, need to be told. And also with an increasing sort of emphasis sort of across cultural lines in diversity more generally. I mean, you see this in television casts as well. So it, it, is, it is now, I think, strange, perhaps almost unthinkable for uh, a new team book to be represented where all of the protagonists would be white. And, and that doesn't look like America. That doesn't look like sort of who we are. And so I think that's great that that, 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 real, that representation, so to speak, has made its way both on the page and increasingly behind the page uh, uh, as well. There's more work to be done there but in general. We talked about superheroes quite a bit, but if you really wanted to get into the headspace of where Americans are at, you really have to look at the villains. Because the villains are the ones that really depict where are our fears? Where do we see the threats? So the villain becomes almost as important as the superhero. I think that's a great question. I mean, or a great, you know, a great prompt. And, uh, you know, you're absolutely, I mean, just to take two quick examples uh, of different kinds of things, right? When you look at Marvel's early creations in the 1960s and these villains, so many of them are communists. Right. So many, right. Marvel really <laughs> comes in the early 60s, right? Really at the height of the Cold War, the classical, right? And they're all, you know, names like the Crimson Dynamo, right? I mean, they're all sort of, you know, uh, uh, you know, a communist affiliate. And that was very, you know, both representing a certain kind of anxiety. And also it was a very easy narrative thing, right? We know who a bad guy, bad guy's the communist. It becomes, I think, you know, uh, more complicated, as we've been saying, sort of as the decades go on, right? But, you know, post. 90s in the 90s and certainly post 9-11, you know, terrorists and particularly non-state affiliated terrorists become a much more easy to sort of point to bad guy. You can look in the 80s and the 90s uh, and you have this more, more rogue state model in a certain way. You still have that a little bit, but, but you had that a lot uh, back then. So I think you're right that on a political way, right, there's a lot, right? There's also the difference between different kinds of motivations. And this also has to do with kind of the audience, right? You didn't see for in comics for kids, for example, 
And you didn't see nihilism really as a kind of motive, you, which makes sense, right? You're going to say, well, why? They, well, you see, they're nihilistic, right? It doesn't <laughs> like Thanos. <laughs> Existentially, they've got a problem. But now with these comics, you know, people, you know, this, the famous sort of line from, uh, from, the, from the movie, right, that the I just want to watch the world burn um, from, from the dark, right, is, you know, is a perfectly plausible motivation or lack of motivation in a comic book universe now. So that, again, shows both where we are uh, in certain ways and also kind of the changing audience. I think he got a theme for a new book there, <laughs> America's Villains. <laughs> well, my next book, maybe we'll talk about that, but my next book is going to be about my next book uh, is about horror. Oh, okay. Yeah, and American Fear. Awesome. So it's, uh, you know, I, I think that's my plan anyway. So based off of that, a little segue, could you explain the dark ages of comics? You know, sometimes they refer to it as the dark ages that mid, I guess, 1980s and then into the almost into 2000. It's dark referring to the storylines or is it the economic darkness? I know that Marvel, for example, is bankrupt in 1996. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're right. That I think it could refer to the economic situation. But generally speaking, when you talk about it, you really are talking about the kind of mood of the comics. And it's sort of what we were sort of saying before, that people are really beginning in some ways to not only look at these motivations for some of these characters, explore kind of other kinds of motivations which never could have possibly occurred in this sort of code era, but also really take those in directions which are quite grim. So one of the famous sort of harbingers of this dark age is uh, Frank Miller's The Dark Knight Returns, which basically makes the argument that Batman is clearly psychotic, right? Uh, you know, if you're dressing up as a giant bat to go and fight crime, right, and you do this and you fight the same bad guys over and over again, right, because you're working out some kind of trauma, this is not a well man, right? And of course, this is not a seven-year-old is like, of course I'm going to dress up as a giant bat and fight crime. That's very right. Criminals are cowardly and superstitious lot. I'll dress up, right? That makes perfect sense. Sure, right, but, you know, and so that's part. Another part would be like, you know, to say, as, as so many of these people did, Alan Moore and others, if you have godlike powers, what is going to stop you from using this for your own personal aggrandizement? Why would you just say, oh, well, of course, I'm going to be altruistic and spend all my time saving people? And what would that look like? And when you combine that with this sort of greater freedom in these sort of non-code scenarios to show violence in a way that you couldn't before, you could imagine that if someone with Superman's powers decides to go bad, this could turn horrific uh, immediately. I think that, uh, you know, it's the equivalent, and I use this consciously because we're talking about this sort of this the little Cold War again. It could, would be like a nuclear strike, mm. like nuclear annihilation. And so there's this sense, this is also, I think, associated with a real kind of questioning of kind of religion, as well, right? Here are these, these heroes, uh, they're, they're gods, basically, but for good and for ill. So you have a lot of all that stuff kind of going around in this brew. And, and, and the, in many ways, the storytelling kind of had to work out those ramifications, which, as we said, were there kind of embryonically from the very beginning. But really, nobody was thinking about them then. And now you have this whole group of people who are working it out. And like any kind of pendulum, they really kind of go all the way over to this kind of way. And I think, you know, that's, that's sort of what happened for, that, for a lot of that period. So the last question I have for you then, based on those comments that you're making, if you look at a TV series now, The Boys, where you have a character like Homelander that does exactly that, he's almost like Superman or has Superman-like powers, and he's terrible. Do you think that's the future? Do you think that we'll continually have these nuanced characters, or will there be a pushback and we'll revert back to their... I guess, a more golden age type of superhero? It's a great question. I mean, I think, you know, The Boys, which is based on a comic book series itself, right? It's a television show. It's a streaming show now, uh, you know, but and, and based on a, a, something that really is sort of by a guy, Garth Ennis, who really know, and, and Derek Robertson, who really knows the comic book world inside and out, has written a lot of this stuff. You know, I think that it is appearing on Amazon. It's just, Amazon is a streaming series. And the role of streaming and the role of sort of these increased channels for uh, content allows for an incredible wide variety of shows about comics. And even if we limit it to the genre of superheroes, which we don't have to, right? but even if we did. And so you have room side by side for a show like 
the boys, which has a very sort of negative, and in some ways, uh, I think even Ennis would agree with this, a kind of narrow vision uh, of what superheroes do. With a show like WandaVision um, or Watchmen, which have much wider horizons for what the characters can do. I think in its own ways, The Boys is as accomplished in a kind of action-packed comedy horror mode as WandaVision, maybe not as Watchmen, which I thought was really a masterpiece. But, but you know, these, these are all great accomplishments. They really are, are working very well at the top of the field. But you have a lot of variety. And I think that that really will continue. And I think that that's, there's a golden age for that as long as you have the combination of this many channels, this much interest, and this cheap special effects. You know, the, the kind of thing that the boys will now do, you know, for an episode of television would have cost, it would have been physically impossible, right? But it would have cost a billion dollars and still looked terrible uh, <laughs> even 10 years ago. And now you can do it. I mean, it's not cheap, but, it, you know, it's, it's just continuing to come down uh, in a lot of ways. So you have those factors. And I think you're going to be able to say, well, I'm going to pick my style of this or my styles and, and we'll see what happens next. I can see that this is the natural progression and you lead to somebody like Homelander and you got a situation where, you know, people are more cynical. But what's almost more surprising is that Captain America is still popular. So <laughs> how do you square those two? Maybe it's just because of that variety. You know, I think that everybody, you know, even little kids, are, as you were saying, sort of the villains are very important. Everybody, who, because we're human, you know, have... That has this wide variety of impulses and instincts and sentiments in them. And sometimes we want to watch something that says, you know, the things that we think are worst about human nature, we want to see them played out on a screen and then have catharsis about that. You know, and that's, that's horror, right? And that's in, in the boy room. And sometimes we want to see something that really says, you know, and I think this is one of the amazing things about the Captain America story. That by dint of desire and will, we will be willing to sacrifice ourselves in order to transform to become a hero. And that we are capable of greatness, not even so much in the superpower, but in kind of the attitude that we have. And we have that aspect of ourselves, too, that we want to, uh, you know. And so sometimes we feel like one and sometimes we feel like another. And it's good that, uh, you know, we have these different sort of options for those different things. You know, not everybody is going to afford themselves one. When I watch with my wife some of the stuff, she any of the more horrific stuff, she's like, no, thank you. No, 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 you, you watch that by yourself. <laughs> um, but, you know, uh, we really have this panorama of material in a way that we haven't had before. And I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful for it. Well, thank you very much, Professor Dauber. I really appreciate it. The book is fantastic, and it really puts in perspective how comics have become an integral part of American history. Thank you so much for having me on. It was a delight and a real pleasure. And uh, for those of you who are listening, you know, the book is available uh, anywhere you get books, uh, in person, you know, on the computer. So uh, enjoy. Well, thanks again. Have a great day. Happy holidays. My guest today was the decorated professor and prolific writer, Dr. Jeremy Dauber. And if you would like to get his new book, American Comics, A History, simply click on the link in the description below. Our featured brew was Buzzman Mutant American Ale from the Unsung Brewing Company of Orange County, California. If you liked our talk today, please share this episode with a friend. And if you want more information on books and authors, like the History of Go-Go Facebook page. The music was provided by the great North Carolina band Bones Fork. And if you would like to check out their brand new album, Beautiful Circle, you can click on their link. It's in the description below as well. Once again, to our growing list of listeners from over 80 countries, 2,000 cities across the globe, I have to say thank you. There are many more great episodes on the way. So join us again next time when we talk, think, and drink on History of Go-Go. Basically, to me, a hero has to be somebody who will sacrifice or will take great chances to help others, but still have human traits, still not be perfect. I, when they become perfect, they become dull.